End gap, the number one most asked question. What should my end gap be? Well, we've got Jimmy Barton here to give you the answer, so stay tuned. Okay, Jimmy, end gap. It is the most frequently asked question, and now there is a chart that comes with all the rings that says what you should do, but I know there's more to the story, so help well, us out. Well, that's a guidance point. The top end gap is set, basically, whether it's a normally aspirated motor or it's a power adder motor, or what type of power adder motor. That boost, nitrous, makes a difference. And what type of piston's in it. That's right, because a hyperutectic piston yes. is going to be hotter because it holds so much more heat. Yes, and they recommend a much higher ring gap. If you're using that piston, you've got to go by what they recommend. Exactly. Other than that, it's based purely on experience. That chart is a guideline and you need to go by it. But always remember, looser won't get you in trouble, tighter will. And that's the question we get, right, is how tight should it be? In my experience, they overthink tightness. They try to make it too tight because they're worried that if they give up a couple thousandths of end gap, they're gonna give up three or four CFM of blow by and I just don't, I don't see it in my experience. I, I don't see it either, and I've run them all the way down to where I could actually see the grind marks on the opposite side of the ring. Mm -hmm. And a few times in the past 40 years, I've actually butted a ring and destroyed a cylinder. Right, and that's so never good. You, you find out where the limit is, you back up from there. I like mean, I said, a little extra gap doesn't really kill you. Extra gap will not kill you. It's just like getting a bearing clearance too tight. It's the same as a ring. If you get it too tight, it's going to hurt something. A little bit loose is not going to hurt it. it. It won't help it, but it's not going to hurt it. Essentially, it's margin of error. The yeah. tighter you get it, the less margin of error you have yes. on your tune-up and operating environment. Because that's kind of the key, is it really is the operating environment and that's going to dictate a lot of this. And you can have the end gap perfect for a... 900 degree cylinder or combustion temperature, mm -hmm. such as alcohol or something. But if that cylinder temperature gets to 1200 degrees, you better have a little extra in there to compensate for it or it's gonna butt the ring. And when it does, it tears stuff up. Because really what we're saying is it's really about cylinder temperature. Yes. And that's where load really plays a big difference. And one, I think one of your best analogies is the difference between you know a small block Chevy or even a big block Chevy in a boat versus a drag car. Well, They're two totally different things. Yeah, a drag car, even if it's a drag boat. The only thing out there with high gear only right now is a top fuel car. Right. But if you're in a boat, that's all you got, high gear only. And it, it's just like loading it against a dyno without pushing the feed button. Yeah, you're just, just letting sitting, it yeah. sit there. Because that, that's all you're doing. And the only gear ratio on that boat is the prop, depending on which one you put on it. And it never changes. So the higher the load, the, the more, more heat. Gap, the more heat you get on the piston. So the more end gap you need to compensate for that. Yes. And it's just like a turbo motor is going to have more heat than a normally aspirated motor. Just because there's more boost, there's more combustion temperature. Right. It's the same thing on a diesel motor, like some of these racing Cum oh, Cummins oh, yeah. engines yeah. with all this boost on them. I mean, they have to have huge end gaps on them because yep. the piston dome gets so hot and it's such a high compression ratio. And if you put one into detonation, all bets are off then. Oh yeah, exactly. Because then the temperature, the combustion temperature goes out of sight. Yeah, really can't help that. <laughs> that's, that's another problem you have to deal with. So okay, that's top end gap. Tell them a little bit about what we've seen with second ring end gap and the top oil rail end gap, because that's something that almost no one ever talks about, but is really important is the end gap on that top oil rail as well. Well, let's use for an example a blower motor. Okay. I have a nostalgia car that has a 427 in it. The top end gap on that motor, mm -hmm. because it's a filled block, has right. no water in it, top end gap on that motor is 36,000. And you know, on what that, bore size is that? It's like, like a 4285 right, okay. or something like that. And the second end gap should be quite a bit more than that. I mean, I've got an extreme on my motor, mm -hmm. but it just shows you that it, and, and the reason it's so extreme is I couldn't get a ring closer to the bore than what I wound up with. 
because it just wasn't available. So my second ring actually has an eighth of an inch on it, 125,000. Wow. But when you got a blower on alcohol, mm -hmm. of course you don't have the cylinder temperature you do on gasoline, but True. you're still gonna have blow by if you've got a severely overdriven blower. So even though I have 125 on the second ring, the motor has very little blow by. Right. So the second ring is only acting as a scraper. Now, yeah, eighty percent of the second ring's job is actually to be oil control. Twenty percent of it's actually sealing, and because they're offset, they're not lined up. Right. It, that top gap doesn't get to see that one hundred twenty-five thousand directly. Right. Now, because I have that big a second end gap, mm -hmm. I open the top oil ring rail up to give it a pass for anything that goes by it to go into the pan. Exactly. And you, you still don't see it. And you only need to open the top ring because it gets into the oil return holes then. Bingo, because that's the thing. In that oil return groove, right, the oil ring groove, there's holes where the oil can drain back into the sump. And yeah. that's the key is you want to give it that path so that this pressure up here can get, that gets by that top ring, can get past the second ring and get into the oil ring groove and go out that oil return hole back to the sump. So on the bottom ring, I like to stay between 15 and 20 thousandths. Okay. That'll work on pretty much anything. All right, and that's pretty much standard. I think even the instructions from Total Seal say minimum, say minimum, minimum, of, 15. minimum of 15. When you yeah. get in a huge bore, like a 4, 6, 50 or something like that, mm -hmm. you may need a little more, but it's, it's very minimal. Theoretically, my motor aside, I would want the second ring to always be bigger than the top. Because if you trap the gas between the top and second, it, can, it will push the top ring off the seat at right. some point. Yeah. And same thing is you need the oil ring, the top oil ring, to be marginally bigger or at least the same size as the second, second ring. ring. So they can so kind of have that balance of flow. I know the rings are supposed to seal the gases in the cylinders, but... Nothing seals 100%. Nothing seals 100%. And if you trap the gas between the rings, it will upset the ring seal. Exactly. And that's where you get all your ring flutter from. And we saw that on the engine dyno when we were doing some oil development stuff. We saw that at that higher engine RPM, what made the biggest difference in increasing power, not really increasing power, but just not losing power. I've actually been doing this on the engines that I used to build for probably five or six years. Mm -hmm. And it really helped the top end power on the motor Yeah, to keep it from nosing over after peak power. Yeah, it stabilized the top it's end. It stabilized the top end. And for many years, I tried to keep it a secret. Yeah, well, it's kind of out You now. can only keep an advantage for so oh, long right. in this business because yeah. it gets out. Oh, yeah. You know, somebody else will get your motor and take it apart. And just like when I tear somebody else's motor apart, I want to see if I can learn anything. Exactly. Well, other engine builders have tore my engines apart and have asked the question why I did that. Yeah. And there's one thing about me, I'll either tell you the truth or I won't tell you. There you go, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's actually pretty kind, actually, right? <laughs> Some people will tell you the wrong direction, totally, so just being silent yeah. or telling you the truth is actually a pretty nice gift. That's true with it. anything that I'm asked. I'll either tell you the truth or I'll just tell you I can't tell you. I, I just remember seeing it when we first started doing it. It's like, wow, that made a big difference in stable. And it makes sense when you think about it. At higher RPM, you know, past peak torque, there's less cylinder pressure to keep that top ring seated. So now that differential in pressure between the, that second ring and the top ring seats makes it easier to unseat that top ring. And when the top ring unseats, yeah, blow by goes it, up, power goes down. It's not necessarily unseating it from the cylinder wall. No, it's from All the it ring is, land. is it's pushing it up off the bottom of the ring land. Bingo. It's not like you're put blowing it off the cylinder wall. No. You're just pushing it up, building enough pressure between the first and second they that can... the ring will raise off the ring land and, and then, now... it, then it doesn't seal. Right, exactly. That's why a lot of the pistons have a, a bevel at the top on the top ring right. that goes to the top is because when the combustion goes behind the ring, it blows it against the cylinder wall, just like same principle as a gas port. Exactly. But on a street motor, you don't run, a, you run about one three to one five on the width of the ring mm -hmm. and where on the race motors we get down to four and five and six tenths because they got gas ports on them. Right. 
And of course then you get into all kinds of coatings and stuff to keep the rings from sticking or welding, but that's, but a, that, that, the, the, that's a different story. Right. That, <laughs> the general idea here is you want that second end gap wider so that you can let that gas pressure get down. Then you want to match that end gap with the top oil rail so that it can get down into the oil ring groove and be able to get through those oil ring hole or the oil return holes to get to the sump. And there's not a set number on it. If it's a wet sump motor with no vacuum on it, you can open it up really pretty big, wide. You know, yeah. 20, 30 thousandths bigger, don't hurt a thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know on the engine performance expo engine, that's a wet sump engine. Yeah. Uh, because it's boosted and everything, we ran 32 thousandths on the top ring, I believe. Yeah, and I think we ran 50 on the second. Yeah, we did. And we opened that oil rail up that much too. We opened the oil rail up to f at least 50. Yeah. The bottom rail was tight. Yep. As, as for what it was. But now that being said, if you've got a dry sump motor, this open air, you can still do that. But if you've got something that's got a vacuum pump on it, a drag race motor, mm -hmm. a round track motor that has a vacuum pump on it, you don't want to open it up quite as much. Yeah, because now it's just going to be too much. It still needs to be a little bigger than the top ring, mm -hmm. and the oil ring still needs to be bigger than the second ring. But you don't want that eighth of an inch gap, gap like I got in my drag car because you're, not, you're going to lose part of your vacuum. Yeah. Even though you got good seals and all, it'll it'll suck by the rings yeah. through the gap. Yeah, so tighten it up now if, a little bit if you're running vacuum. And if you're pulling big vacuum, it doesn't hurt nothing to have the total seal top ring. Yeah, it can pull if a lot more vacuum if in. You're, if you're pulling vacuum, yeah. yes, I, I have no problem with that whatsoever. Yeah. So there's, it actually works best in that application. Well, there, my experience, right? If you're going to run that a gapless top ring, that's where having a big vacuum system can make a big difference. Everything's a little different. You know, the marine engines are different from the drag motors. Mm -hmm. The dirt engines are different from the asphalt engines. Yep. Because they ingest, there's no way you can keep the cylinders clean. Enough. No, no, there's dirt. I mean, there's just all dirt. The time. I don't care how good a filter you got on it. No, there's going to be just sand and stuff that gets in there and it's going to wear on the cylinders. It's going to wear the rings. It's, it, it's just going to happen. Yeah, you can run a, a tool steel or a stainless top ring in it and not wear the ring, but it's going to wear the ring land because it's going to get stuff in between it. It's just, right. there's a shorter rebuild time on the dirt motors just because of the dirt. Oh, yeah. I mean, Think about it, Temkin, what they've said all along, the number one reason for a bearing failure of a rolling bearing or a plane bearing is dirt, it's contamination. So you're running in a dirty environment, by necessity, you're going to have a shorter operating life because it's a dirtier environment. Well, the trick to that is lead to race. That does help. <laughs> Helps a lot. Hopefully this little segment here gave you some answers to kind of give you some perspective on what your top end gap should be, how to think about the second end gap, and take advantage of the little trick of setting your oil rail gap as well. The big thing is just make sure that the second ring's bigger than the top, and the top oil rail is at least equal to the second, and don't make them too tight. You heard it. You heard it from the man. He's been 277 miles an hour at Bonneville, so you should listen to him.